afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Steve Leach, and I'm responsible for the DCS product portfolio for Siemens Digital Industries in the UK and Ireland. Um, so that, that covers our, our, our main DCS platform, Somatic PCS7, Somatic PCS Neo, and also uh, a kind of a quite a wide array of different kind of software uh, solutions focused around the pro process industries. Um, just to kind of echo uh, Graham's comments, thank you for taking the time to join the webinar today. Um, one thing's for sure that uh, during the, the, the very strange 12 months that we've had, uh, webinars have, have been uh, in plentiful supply. So uh, I appreciate you taking the, uh, the opportunity to join us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'll just quickly run through the agenda. Um, so <clears throat> just four areas I'm, I'm going to cover. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, digitalization and what we refer to within Siemens as the digital enterprise. I'll then kind of explore further the concept of the digital twin, which I'm sure many of you have uh, heard about before. Um, but then I want to really kind of try and bring this to life with um, some examples of where customers are, are utilizing data, um, whether that be from um, a, a, the aspect of improving their efficiency of their manuf manufacturing activities, or maybe um, also from the perspective of their business models and how they're going to market and some of the opportunities that are arising through kind of utilizing uh, digitalization as an approach and utilizing data in a different way to change how they go to markets. And I think that should take us about 25 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. Um, as Steve said, if there are questions, that there's a and a session at the end. Um, but please fee feel free to uh, drop any questions in the chat um, and I'll try and answer them for you um, at, at the end. If not, if it's uh, something I can't answer, I will uh, take it away and uh, come back to you. So uh, digitalization and the digital enterprise. If we look at this slide, um, don't worry, you haven't joined a history lesson. I'm not going to be testing you on when the first industrial revolution was or anything like that. Um, and it's probably fair to say that the, the use of the phrase, the fourth industrial revolution or industry four is used much less frequently than it used to be. but I think I wanted to kind of position this because digitalization absolutely is complementary to what we know in terms of the electrification and automation of industry. But the difference, of course, with digitalization is the real focus is on data and it's very often referred to as the revolution of data. And it, it, it's in this area that, that we're, we're seeing way more opportunities being created and it's not just companies like ourselves um actually the founder of dell believes that their next trillion dollars will come from the use of data so it's a very important commodity and digitalization or digital transformation however you want to refer to it is now seen as one of the five mega trends which are shaping our world alongside things like urbanization globalization, demographic change, and of course, climate change, which it, of course is a, uh, I was going to say hot topic, but that's uh, probably not a very good phrase to use for that. But it, it, it's growing significant, uh, significantly even, I couldn't even say the word, significantly. And in the last 12 months, over 50% of the world's data was produced. But interestingly, less than 0.5% of that data has been analyzed. And for me, herein lies the opportunity that digitalization creates for us all. So we often use this claim in Siemens, digitalization changes everything, but it's true. Um, if I kind of step away from um, the industrial world for a second and, and think about our day-to-day -day lives, and there are so many kind of examples here of how demand and the need for customization of products and services is, is changing hugely. 
just think of the last 12 months and, and the, the, the global pandemic that we were, were still going through, it's only really amplified that kind of need and demand, um, but also it, it sped up significantly a change in our habits. Think of something like streaming. Streaming was always something, a market that was growing for many years, but there's been such a shift towards demand-based services like Netflix, Amazon, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, whichever your, your poison may be, or maybe you subscribe to all of them, where you've almost got infinite amount of choice. But they've, they've then sort of recognized that in, in our lives, we haven't been able to experience things like going to the cinema, and they've started to move into that area. How we own and listen to music is another prime example of how over the last few years, the industry has become service led rather than product led with less and less of us owning the product. And this has seen the rise of services again, such as Apple Music, Spotify, where the emphasis has definitely been on choice, ease of access and personalization based on what you like to listen to. And I think it's fair to say without digitalization, Many of the businesses um, operating now and who are consumer focused may not have survived during the pandemic. Think about how we've been able to order food, whether that be from a restaurant, from a grocery service, um, all the things we've been able to do. Amazon are, are obviously the, the, the masters at this and they're not kind of creating a new idea. They're basically a shop. But the focus is on the service, the focus is on the interface, the focus is around how they use the data to tailor their service to you as an individual customer. And we, we, we do quite a lot with Amazon and, and they're, they're talking about the fact that next day delivery, that isn't their issue. Um, that their biggest issue is, is how they do one hour delivery. That's where they're looking at, maybe half hour delivery as our expectations as users and consumers kind of increase. So that's kind of how we're, we're sort of sitting outside of the world of work. More and more, we're getting used to service-based digital interfaces to customize our products, customize our experience, whatever it may be. And they're definitely starting to change and impact on how industry is working. And the classic one is obviously automotive, where you can configure one of hundreds, if not thousands of options in a car, and it will be designed exactly how you want it based on the specification of what you've um, driven, uh, sorry, configured. Um, you are starting to see it way more in the fashion industry as well, but ultimately these things are manufactured. So companies like Adidas, for example, they're engaging into a lot more customization of products, but their facilities have got to be flexible to be able to respond to that customization. But also we think about industries like pharmaceutical with the drive towards the batch of one. And it's not just the batch of one, it's a customized batch of one spe specifically aimed at you as a patient. So, these this whole aspect of customization this whole aspect of digitalization is starting to change in my opinion everything in industry and the way we live and i believe that this change will of pace will only get faster as we move forward so i i mentioned um the digital enterprise this is this is what we refer to within siemens um, it's, it's an approach, it's a, it's a philosophy um, that, that covers both process and discrete focused industries. Um, it typically engage with some form of cloud-based solution, whether it be AWS from Amazon, Azure from Microsoft, or our own platform, Mindsphere, where we're a lot more focused on the industrial side of things. But fundamentally, these automation and industrial software solutions are underpinned by three key areas. Industrial communication. I, I guess many of you have sat on uh, seminars or, or planning to sit on seminars around industrial 5G. And we hear about how this is going to revolutionize our lives outside of work and inside of work. Things like Wi-Fi 6, 
So communication as a topic is obviously a key aspect of digitalization. And more connectivity then leads to the potential for things like cybersecurity related incidents. So a real focus on industrial security, things like IEC 62443 and, and the standards developed around that in terms of the whole cybersecurity aspects are increasing a lot. But also the ability to provide a lot of digital services as well. And in the 12 months that, that we've just been through, the ability to do um, things like digital factory acceptance tests, um, digital engagement with customers. We've seen examples of people using things like Google Glass type um, arrangements to do things like remote support and things like that. So these are kind of the, the, the pillars of what we talk about when we talk about digitalization or from a Siemens perspective, digital enterprise. But the important thing is it's a life cycle based approach. As, as I said, it, it's both from the discrete industries perspective and also the process industries perspective. And it's fair to say in the discrete world, it's a bit easier to kind of um, con kind of put, put context around the product, etc. Whereas in the process world, so much is going on in pipes and vessels, etc. But things like modeling um, tools and software um, to model how a product may react in a different way. Um, those kind of things, thinking about the fundamental design of the product, how that then potentially influences um, the process and plant design itself. And that same set of data then being used for engineering and commissioning and then operations and ultimately the services that, that, that come out of the back of that. But this is all kind of got to be geared around being accessible and as much as I would love to say in the UK, we are in a greenfield market with lots and lots of greenfield um, investment. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. There's a lot of brownfield focus and typically in a brownfield plant, there's already data. So there's already an existing data source that could be exploited, but typically we haven't focused on those areas and typically we haven't looked to explore the potential value that there could be in that data. So the digital twin, if I spend a little bit of time talking about the digital twin. So this is where we, we start to think about the virtual world and the real world. Um, there are kind of two aspects to it in terms of the engineering side of things. So this is the, the, the digital twin of the plant, the asset, the product, whatever it may be. Um, it's thinking about how that data associated with the design of the product can be can be then utilized in the manufacture of the product. And this idea that it's it's a, a kind of a, 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 a cycle, a life cycle, and it's not just you make your product, we you design your product, you make it, you, you, you ship it out and that's it. There's, there's the input coming back in as well. And, and this is like the performance data. How is the product performing? If, if that be an OEM based machine, how reliable is it? How, how much uptime does that have? And the, the kind of the connectivity, the digitalization aspects of this is, is key really in terms of being able to understand that. But for me, again, that all starts with data. Without the data, you don't know where you're at. So um, lots of flashy software and, and things don't help you if you haven't got the fundamental data of understanding how does your machine work. And kind of this concept of this all encompassing digital twin probably is, isn't right. We, we, we see kind of that there being three aspects in terms of the digital twin, the product itself, um, the whole production twin, so that the project be, uh, product even being made, and then the performance twin, which is really then focused on how that product is working out in the marketplace. And again, you will see there industrial security underpinning that. Um, if I bring this to life for you with an example, we have a variable speed drive manufacturing facility in Congleton. Um, they have invested heavily in, in the concept of the digital twin. Um, we use a, a VR cave to simulate and uh, develop um, the components that go into 
making those variable speed uh, drives and being able to visualize them, see them in a very simple, clear way. We take that design in the virtual cave and then bring that into a simulation of how that might be manufactured so that we can manufacture it in the most efficient way possible. Um, and it's really focused on engagement from people, but utilizing the technology um, to ensure that the, the production cells, the movement of people are optimized as much as possible so that ultimately when that virtual factory is brought into life, we've got the most efficient um, facility that we can have. And obviously the aim in, in that is to, to, to deliver a product as efficiently as possible. And if I talk about, I, I spoke about at the beginning, the drive towards customization. Well, that exists here. There are variable speed drive products have many different um, options that you could possibly have. And um, to give you an idea, um, with the with the utilization of the, um, the, the the virtual product simulation then the virtual production simulation we've been able to reduce the the time it takes to um, put together one of our, our standard products from days to less than one hour we want to take that exact same concept for a standard product also for a customizable product which is a big challenge in itself, but it's one that we're well on the way to uh, to delivering against. And one of our, our latest product releases, the G120X, which is fully customizable as a product, it's utilizing that same standard product philosophy on a customized solution for, for a user so that you can get that same performance. Uh, yeah, sorry, same performance, you can get that same customization. So. This is happening, we're, we're, we're doing this kind of stuff, we're taking these kind of approaches in our own facilities, but it's driven still by the use of data. And kind of, I, I often find that when we talk about um, these kind of topics, a lot of it is, it's quite theoretical and um, it's always best, I think, if it can be brought to life in the, the form of examples. So I've got, quite a few examples that I'd like to step through with you that, that are from different customers across the world, um, some in the UK, um, and that they're all kind of focused on how they're utilizing data e e either to um, be more efficient or um, to change their business model, for example, to, to look at things and maybe an outcome-based approach. So let me just uh, whiz through um, some of these um, examples and, and and this is really what I'm kind of referring to as the opportunity for operations. So if I take the first one, this is um, a, a, a project um, or a, a production uh, paint facility, a paint production facility even um, with uh, Dulux in Australia. Um, and this is all driven behind our desires to have whatever color paint we want um, and having our own customized specific look in, in, in your house. And um, this real drive led Dulux to commit $127 million um, into a new production facility in Merrifield, uh, just north of Melbourne. Um, the plant has a capacity to produce 75 million liters of paint per year, but the key goal was to be able to manufacture efficiently batch sizes down to 100 litres or one pallet. This has been achieved and now they're able to, uh, it's now able to be done eight times faster due to the use of data and digital technology. So this is just one example of how consumer trend is impacting manufacturing facility, manufacturing facility design and ultimately being able to uh, respond to that consumer trend. The second um, example is a very simple example. 
and probably one that, that that's close to a lot of people's hearts on this call. Um, this is uh, from DuPont in, in the USA, and um, they are using one of our app-based solutions to optimize the maintenance regimes uh, related to um, their, their valve positioners. So an intelligent valve positioner, it's nothing new. Um, they've been around for a long time, but it kind of highlights one of the points I made towards the beginning around there are many devices out there that have the capability and are producing data that is not necessarily used. This is an example of utilizing that data, taking it, contextualizing it in a, in a way um, that is simple to be able to then port into an app and the app will allow uh, or allows the end user to utilize, uh, really plan how they are um, utilizing the, the, the valves and the maintenance regime associated with that. So it allows them to predict when the valves need to be serviced. And it's not based on a traditional, well, every 12 months we do it. It's based more on the actual data and the actual demand um, so that they can make those decisions based on priority and requirements of activities. Like I said, this is, this is, not, this is not rocket science by any stretch of the imagination. It's using an existing data source. It's pushing it into an app. It's showing it you in a different way to then allow you to make a decision around something very simple like this. But the reduction in the operation costs, for example, um, has, has been significant for the company and the simple things like less wear and tear, not just doing maintenance activities because we've always done it, making that decision intelligently based on what is needed to be maintained. Taking that concept slightly further, and unfortunately I can't talk about this one in, in detail in terms of the actual customer, but this is using uh, predictive uh, models, um, AI, um, to be able to take again existing sources of data, but more in a in a more complex um, application. Um, this was around the, the turbine um, at a facility, and it's utilizing data science techniques um, on that uh, turbine to to understand its its operating model, its ideal operating model, and being able to quickly in real time identify. Um, anomalies that may have a, a serious impact on the day-to-day -day running of the plant. So with the example that, uh, that we're talking about, um, the, the model actually detected an issue on, on the turbine and it was actually two days before the DCS even picked up on there being an issue with the alarm. And they responded to what the model was telling them and this basically meant that they stopped the plant being shut down because if this turbine um, stopped, the facility would have stopped and that would have been a disaster. But things like data science, things like the, the, the predictive kind of models, things like AI, they're starting to be utilized more and more across manufacturing. The next example is one with GSK. And this, this is one where um, we worked with them at um, a facility which is very hard to uh, say the name of, but it's the Intelligent Immersive Manufacturing Facility at GSK in Stevenage. I really do wish they'd have thought of an easier name to say than that. But this fundamentally was the sandbox uh, kind of facility for all of their ideas and developing and testing um, what they see as the state of the art, art technology and digital techniques to then be rolled out across their existing manufacturing facilities. And from the very beginning of this, that they made it very clear to us that data was a real key aspect to this because what they wanted to be able to achieve was that a plant effectively could be ran by a scientist, not necessarily a, a, a regular operator, so to speak. And you, you probably can't see the detail in, 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 the, in the photo here, but, um, what you can see here is one of the action boards um, that was developed um, based on the existing data sources to bring the facility to life 
in such a way that, um, as I said, scientists could make the decisions around how the plant operated and how the facility operated. Okay, this is on a smaller scale, it's on like a pilot type uh, facility, but it shows how data can be used and how it can be contextualized in a certain way to really have an impact on how a facility is operated. This example is an interesting one. Um, it's all around the manufacture of bicycle helmets. So this is thinking about a slightly different business model. It's thinking about uh, different techniques from manufacturing, like additive manufacturing as, as, as the, the way forward for how they um, manufacture their product. It's thinking about having scalable based solutions but again, it's driven by us as users wanting that kind of bespoke product. So they've got an app where you basically measure your head and from that data, they will create, they will 3D print your um, customized um, bicycle helmet. And they're using the, the, the whole digital twin concept to be able to allow them to uh, kind of create much faster scalable production cells that are transportable to different parts of the world based on where they need to manufacture on demand. This next um, example is one that um, we've been working on for quite some time. This is something um, that is with Yorkshire Water and it's based on again artificial intelligence it's based on utilizing real-time data as it says there to make sewer smarter and prevent pollution um, yorkshire water has over 55,000 kilometers of sewers and they have to monitor them for blockages and, and prevent pollution incidents anyone who's familiar with the water industry knows um, how important um, stopping uh, pollution of any form of uh, any type is to them and the associated fines that they could have um, with that. So we worked with uh, Yorkshire Water to essentially uh, pull together a, an app based product for them based on a, an AI model that took various sources of data. So existing data, the sensor data, real time rainfall, etc, to give them early warning of when an issue might happen um, and this predictive model allows a fast response to be carried out and we've seen that, um, that the model itself has an 88 percent hit rate success rate on issues and it's actually reduced the number of false alarms by 50 percent this was done in a really collaborative approach it was done siemens be between ourselves um, yorkshire water and the university of sheffield and ultimately, this, this technology, this approach is, is leading to cleaner rivers and a healthier environment in the Yorkshire Water region. The last example that I wanted to touch on is, is probably one of the first that we really got involved with in the UK. And this is with an OEM called Track Wrap, um, where they were a classical OEM. They make, um, uh, they wanted, they, they, they make machines that uh, wrap uh, products and they got a specific uh, challenge that they wanted to meet. Um, we started to talk to them about the digital twin and how they could produce their machine virtually and see how it reacted to different things, see how it reacted to different uh, makeups of products and things like that so that they can start to produce their uh, machine a lot quicker and as it says there, reduce the time to market by 40%. Um, but it also was about um, thinking about how they could service their customers in a better way. How could they differentiate themselves um, from their competitors? And they've been able to see through utilizing the, the kind of the model approach, the digitalization aspects, and really modeling how, how the product works and functions, they've been able to um, kind of achieve a 72% reduction in the machine downtime. 
So that then has a real impact on their end users and their ability to, to produce their product. But the interesting piece is around the data and how they've used data to allow them to fundamentally sell this in a completely different way. And that they're, they're starting to do it on a paper wrap basis. It, it, it's a bit like, I guess, Rolls Royce and uh, airplane engines and essentially that the business model based around the airtime that the plane is in the air. That, that very similar business model has been taken by TrackRap to be innovative around how they then charge for their machines. So there's no upfront capital cost for the end user. We're, we're supporting them with our, our Siemens financial services, but it's allowing them to have a different business model, a different approach. And as I said, this kind of pay per wrap type approach to how they uh, service their customers. And they're only a, a relatively small company, so they're an SME, and they've adopted the digital technologies, they've adopted the, the ability to, to design in a virtual world, and certainly the, the kind of the insight-driven product development is, is paying dividends for them as they, they produce their, their next generations of machines and they grow as an organization. So I've covered quite a few different um, examples there uh, that I wanted specifically to not just make it all about one area. Um, I wanted to think about and, and hopefully give, give some insight into the types of customers we're engaged with, the types of ways in which data is being used in different ways. And as I said before, many times this data already exists and it's about extracting it. It's about then taking that data. Data is useless on its own unless you can kind of contextualize it against something. What your something may be like the valve positioner kind of um, app that I mentioned, that was all around the number of strokes, the number of operations of the valve and going, yeah, that's still healthy. No, that one isn't. That one wasn't scheduled to be um, to be maintained um, for another 12 months, but this one that's healthy is scheduled to be maintained next week. Why do it if the data's telling you not to? Would you not switch them around in terms of your maintenance plan? And sometimes we just don't think about these simple wins that, that we could have with data that's locked up in, in existing infrastructures and in existing um, plants or process processes. So just coming to the end and just to really summarize um, from, from my perspective. So digitalization is the, the, the revolution of data. There's no doubt we see it in our everyday lives. And I think even more so driven by um, our industry and driven by um, the demands of, of I'm, I'm sure we'll all have um, apprentices in our companies and organizations and graduates they are so much used to um, certain ways of doing things that maybe industry isn't used to yet. But I think some of those expectations and demands will be driven by um, newer, fresher ideas into the industry. Um, but it's the revolution of data. It's using that data to turn it into value. If you can't turn it into something valuable, do you really need it? The digital twin, we talk a lot about the digital twin. It can take many different forms, as I said, thinking about the products, the production, and essentially the operating life of the product. Make data work. Making data work is all about being able to collect it. How many facilities have heart-based instruments that are not utilizing that data that is there free? We could look at things in a completely different way, just starting at that basic point, looking at some of that additional data outside of the primary measurements to support a different approach, maybe to maintenance, maybe it highlights something that we hadn't recognized about the environmental temperature, for example, and its impact on, on the production of a product, for example. But ultimately, I think it's about embracing the opportunity. It's about trying to think differently about how the use of data could really impact a business. The track wrap, the, the reason I finished on the track wrap um, 
example was because of the impact that it had on them as an SME. They could have just decided to stick on doing what they're doing, going head to head with their competitors, and it's probably only going to go one way. It's going to be kind of a race to the bottom in terms of price. They've thought of it differently. They've adopted digitalization, digital techniques in their manufacturing. They're taking advantage of that from a serviceability perspective. But I think even, even better and bigger than that is how they've taken advantage of it from a business model perspective. And because they have all of this data coming back from their machines, they're able to charge in a completely different way. So that was everything I wanted to cover. Um, I think it took about half an hour, I'm not 100% sure, but um, hopefully you found that interesting.